afternoon, this evening's <coughs> webinar, uh, Fortuna webinars tend to attract business school applicants from all over the world in all different time zones and uh, we're delighted uh, that, that you can join us. Um, Valentine's Day may be over, but is there still time to show the love to business schools if you uh, want to secure a place in, uh, in the fall of 2017? So uh, the theme of uh, today's webinar is applying to business school in round three or in certain cases round four, even round five, depending on the schools and the way that they have uh, structured um, their deadlines. The, um, the former uh, dean of the MBA program at Stanford um, loves tea rooms and uh, I remember sitting with her uh, enjoying a cup of tea as she explained that um, at Stanford uh, just a few years ago in uh, the final round of admissions they received over 2,000 applications but she knew that they only had three places left and, and I'll leave uh, all of our viewers to do the math on that one. Um, in fact the word that Sharon used uh, to describe chances that year was catastrophic which would probably earn her some plaudits as a junior Scrabble champion. Um, but there's the reality for, for Stanford but um, what does it look like across uh, other top US and European and international business schools? So to answer that question, um, I'm delighted to, to share this webinar with um, uh, Jessica Chung, who was a senior associate director at uh, UCLA Anderson, and with her, uh, Caroline Diati Edwards, who was the former director of admissions at INSEAD. And uh, um, from previous sessions, and obviously the delight of working with these two uh, individuals at Fortuna, they have tremendous experience, uh, and I'm sure uh, plenty to share. Um, the webinar is also intended, of course, to answer your own questions. And um, uh, if you can type your messages in the question uh, menu, uh, we'll pick those up as, as we go. And while we've prepared uh, some material for the first part of the session, um, I'll keep uh, an eye out on those questions and uh, share them uh, with Jessica and with uh, Caroline. So I've set the scene with Stanford and maybe um, a, a fairly particular, but um, you know, for both of you, as we look at whether they call it round three, round four, certainly the final rounds that close out this admission cycle, is it really worth considering a, a round three late round application to begin your MBA program in August or September? Right. Um well, Matt, you know, it really depends. It depends on a lot of factors. So it depends on the scores that you're looking at and it depends on your particular profile and um, how urgent it is for you to apply to business school now or whether you can wait until a little bit later. Um, so for the, for the US schools, um, I mean, as you were saying, for schools like Stanford and really for the M7 schools, um, most of the places have been allocated in, in the first two rounds. And so um, it might not be quite as extreme as the numbers that you mentioned um, earlier for, for Stanford at that particular time, but it might not be far off. And so, uh, you know, you have to be prepared that the odds um, may be stacked against you in, in round three for those, those very, very top schools. Um, having said that, uh, you know, the schools that are um, perhaps beyond the, the M7 but still very strong programs, um, will still have places in round three. The competition may be a little bit tighter um, than earlier rounds, but it's not going to be the same extreme that you would see at, at Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton in those rounds. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, there are also uh, four rounds or even more rounds than that with some of the international schools. So at INSEAD, where I used to work, there are four rounds. London Business School has four rounds. Um, and some of the, the other schools um, have, have more rounds than that. So that gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, I would say that with, uh, with, with London Business School, round four um, can get a bit tighter than round three. Um, in Seattle, it really depends on your profile. The school tries to keep the level of competition consistent across rounds where possible. But if you have a very common profile, um, then avoiding the final round um, may also be a good idea for, for that school. Um, and, and in general, I would say that um, at, at this stage in the final round, schools are not looking any longer so much for, uh, you know, for the investment bankers, uh, for the management consultants. They've already seen a lot of fantastic applications from those profiles. Um, so they tend to use the final round more to 
um, fill out the class with some diverse candidates um, where they feel that you know that person is going to bring perspective that would otherwise not be represented in the classroom. Um, so if you've got a profile that you think is a bit different from the average MBA candidate, then you may have a, a, a decent chance in round three. So I would say you know it depends on the school that you're applying to. Um, it depends on your individual profile. And then it may also depend on your individual circumstances. Um, you know, age may be a factor that you want to take into account. If you feel that, um, you know, if you wait for the next season and therefore you'd be delaying your MBA by another 12 months and, and that um, your age may start to count against you in the applicant pool if you're, you know, you're above the average age for the, um, for the program, or you feel that, you know, now is the right time in your career and um, you really have to um, take the, the, the break, the study break now, rather than postponing it for, you know, essentially now would be another 18 months if you don't apply until the fall. Um, you may feel that, you know, you have to give it your best shot now um, because the timing might not work later on. Yeah. <clears throat> Jessica, obviously Anderson as one of the, the, the top schools and, and has its own dynamic. In recent years it's seen double digit growth in, uh, in, in applicant volume which may be providing its own squeeze for, uh, for the final round. What, what, what is your perspective from, uh, from the time that you spent at the school? Um, yeah, I mean I would say Anderson is probably typical for many of the US schools um, that have a round three and or four um, for those later rounds. It is much more competitive. Um, you're definitely competing for a very small number of spaces. And um, indeed, there, you know, with Anderson, there was an increase in applications over the years. Um, but I think that most admissions committees and most schools will keep in mind that there are always going to be some strong applicants in round three. So they're going to always not try to overfill the class or fill the class by the first two rounds. They're going to make sure that they have some space open. Um, but there's so many other factors that come into play when they're making these decisions, like you know, um, the quality of the applicant pool, maybe yield, you know, matriculation rates, like maybe matric rates might be higher or lower than they might have anticipated. So it's it's all like kind of an art and finessing. So by round three, um, I think there is definitely going to be space for most schools. It's just the number is going to probably vary, but but I think the commonality is that they're gonna it's going to be much more competitive. And like Caroline was mentioning, a lot of times. You know, schools are going to be looking for those interesting profiles, I think, to round out the class and enhance that diversity. Um, I think that's really going to stand out versus maybe adding yet another consultant or yet another finance person or whatever that might be a little bit more standard or typical, uh, you know, within the applicant pool. So Adele picking up a Grammy in Los Angeles last weekend, um, she might stand a better chance in, in round three than, um, than some of the rest of us. Now, some of the business schools, and I'm thinking of... Um, Columbia with its rolling admissions, which which is different again, but certainly you know Duke, Tuck, uh, actually have um, early action or early decision uh, right at the beginning of, of the admissions cycle. So, so how does round three uh, sort of compare? How's how's it different from previous rounds? And is the admissions office using different factors? You've talked about you know profiles um, that, that that may sort of stand out. They've already uh, got their fill of uh, engineers or. Uh, investment bankers. Um, so are there any other qualities and factors that you think come into play when assessing uh, candidates at this uh, late stage in the cycle? Uh -huh. um, I mean, I would say a couple of things come to mind for me. Um, like, I, like we mentioned, it's just overall much more competitive because of that lack of space. And by that point, the admissions office has a better understanding of what the applicant pool is looking like for this particular season. So in rounds one and two, or round one especially, you know, you're, it's still the beginning of the season and the cycle and you don't have the majority of your applications in. By the time you're getting through your round two, you have a better understanding of the composition of the pool, how competitive you know, the applicants are for the year. And so I think you just have a better gauge of, of the, the quality of the candidates that you have coming in or applying, and then that you ultimately want to admit into the program. Um, and I mean, for me, I felt like when we were looking at round three, um, I think admissions officers tend to get kind of fatigued by this point because They've already gone through thousands and thousands of applications by the time March or April rolls around. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really looking for people that kind of stood out, like in a very interesting way. It could be um, 
you know, someone that has maybe a more non-traditional background, um, but has a very focused and very realistic reason for why they want to go to business school. Um, you know, like in the past, I remember someone who came from the restaurant industry um, and wanted to make a career change into something that was very different. Um, but still had a really compelling profile because you know there is strong evidence of leadership, great uh, academics and test scores, and so we're like, oh, this is a this is kind of different. I'm and the person also made a good compelling case for why um, he or she was applying in round three, maybe a little later in the cycle. So there was still that genuine interest in wanting to go to business school. There was a, this sense of oh, I'm just applying to your program because I didn't get in anywhere else, and you're kind of my last chance before the year is over. Um, so showing, conveying that genuine interest, deep knowledge of the program, um, made meaningful engagement, interaction with the admissions office and students, um, even if it wasn't for a, you know, maybe it was just for a short window of time, but it didn't come across like I literally just talked to you guys a week ago, now I'm going to apply. Um, it just really made it, um, they really conveyed that, that, that sense of wanting to be a part of the um, the Anderson community, and I think for most schools, they want that. They don't want to feel like, oh, you know, you're my, you're kind of my last backup plan, and I'm just applying to you, and and my application is just not going to be very strong because I don't, I didn't put as much care into it as I did perhaps with the other schools I, I might have applied to. Um, so I think it's a matter of just showing, continuing to show that that interest. Um, and also, in certain ways, you might have to put a little more care into your round three application because knowing, I think going into the process knowing and understanding that the third round or the last round is going to be very competitive. So you've really made a, you've really kind of done a lot of self-reflection and you've really thought about what is it that's unique about yourself or that can really enhance the community at the school you're applying to. Um, what are some experiences that you've had that others, your peers, can really learn from that you can give back to. Uh, you know, those are all kind of ways that you can stand out, uh, you know, in round three so that as the admissions office is looking to finalize and kind of round out the class, you know, your profile and your application will stand out versus the rest that they have coming in, um, you know, kind of through the fodder. Uh, we've all <clears throat> sort of grown up with um, uh, airlines that have um, deliberately overbooked flights uh, and we find ourselves, you know, uh, waiting at JFK and no possibility of uh, getting home uh, tonight. Um, <clears throat> does that happen with business schools in terms of you know, round one and round two? You know, Jessica, you just talked about uh, by this stage we've got a pretty good sense of, uh, you know, who, who we've already admitted uh, and of course the yield that the school is enjoying as, as you compete with, with other uh, schools. Does it that ever then happen that you're already full, or perhaps the opposite that there's um, there's a scramble, and you realise that, um, that the yield hasn't been what it is, and and round three or that final round suddenly becomes very important to um, you know fill all the places in the classroom for September. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, when it comes to yield, there's always historical information that schools will use in terms of you know, applicant numbers and the percentage of students admitted who end up enrolling and such. But there are always going to be those years where, you know, you'll have a, 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 a fluke or an aberration and, and, you know, maybe you have higher yield than you anticipate or lower. Um, but it's something that you just can never fully predict. And so, you know, I think, I mean, I've, I think in the past at Anderson, you know, we always went with the idea that there's always going to be strong candidates in round three. So don't put all your eggs into just baskets from round one and two and you know intentionally oversubscribe or over enroll. I don't think I think most schools won't want to do that. They, I, I don't think that that would be a good strategy to have just because then you're gonna miss out on so many you know solid and you know great applicants from those that last round. Um, and it probably isn't a good thing to for word to go out on the street that your school doesn't admit people from round three because then that might just you know turn people away from applying. And so you know we really wanted to have a balance in terms of um, folks that we admitted from each of the rounds. And I mean, there's always a wait list too. So you know, if there was a reason why there you know if yeah. there were not enough people enrolling, then there's always a wait list to go back to. Um, but definitely round three is, is um, you know, there will be fo folks admitted from that round. Right. Can, Caroline, I remember you um, sharing that you once worked with some PhD students at INSEAD uh, in the seven years that you were the admissions director there to actually sort of work out, um, you know, can, can we look at his, sort of historical activity and you know make sure that we're not admitting certain perhaps weaker profiles in round one just because it is round one, 
and then miss out on some great applicants uh, in, in, in the final round. So, you know, from your experience at um, this, uh, what was the perspective as you went into those final rounds? Yes, yeah, I mean, I did, uh, one of the things that I did there was try to try to um, smooth the offer rate across rounds. So, um, so, as you say, you know, try to make sure that we're able to take the best of the entire pool rather than just the best of the initial rounds. Um, and uh, and keep you know the level of competition consistent, and also to avoid having a higher offer rate in the final round, as you mentioned, you know, in the scenario where um, you have slightly lower yield than expected. Um, you know, it's always a, a juggling game in admissions to try to you know manage the numbers and get the right class size without overshooting or undershooting, because you get in trouble if you have end up with too many students or too few. Um, so. Um, you know, the schools also, you know, as Jessica mentioned, use the wait list a lot to manage that process as well. So in round three, you know, you're also going to be compared to who is who is on the wait list and, um, you know, how does that wait list pool compare to who is coming in in the third round or, or the fourth round at, at NCAD. Um, and, and um, you know, the school will at that stage be pulling some people off the wait list. So, you know, the wait list is a very good tool for the schools to use as a buffer um, to enable them to, you know, manage the, um, the variability in the yield. Um, so, you know, the percentage of people actually accepting your offer because you, you know, as Jessica said, the schools will, um, you know, keep very careful track of historical numbers of um, admission, you know, application volume and yield. I didn't see out, you know, yield was slightly different for the January class versus the September class. So you're very careful to take all that into account. And, you know, run your simulations of how many applications you expect by rounds, and of those, how many will, will accept. And I um, mean, you know, yield can also vary by profile. Um, so you know, the schools are uh, are very careful to try to manage that so that they you know make the most of the pool that they have, and don't find themselves in a situation where uh, you know you're accepting people at the start of the, of the season that you would reject at the end, or or vice versa. Um, so um, uh, I'm just going to add something to that. Just come back to me in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, um, in, in in terms of um, uh, some of the practicalities then of um, uh, the, the different schools, because they are competing with one another, um, where scholarships uh, fit into this, or, or visa requirements, of course, for international students and the encouragement yeah. to. To, to apply earlier in, in the process. Maybe you can speak to, to your own school experiences, but uh, just how that tends to work across the top schools. Yes, so I mean, it's better to apply early if um, you know, you're looking for scholarship funding and, and also you know, if you're going to have a long process to apply for a visa. Um, and, and so you know, that's something to take into account at this stage that there may be less financing options available um, in, the, in the later rounds. Um, so, uh, you know, if you are going to be dependent on scholarship financing to a certain extent, then you may be better off waiting until um, round one of the next season than, than applying now. Um, you know, certainly at INSEAD, um, the, uh, the, 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 the scholarship financing is oriented more towards round one and round two than round three and round four. I mean, there still are some funds available, but they're much more limited. Um, and, and then also, um, you know, visas can take some time. You know, there are always a handful of students who are um, scrambling at the last minute to, to get their visas together, and it's a very stressful process for them because, you know, you're not, not, never quite sure if it's going to come together and it's not entirely under your control of the candidate or the school, right? You're dependent on authorities that are not always the fastest moving. So um, certainly, you know, that's something to, to take into account very carefully as you, as you plan your timing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also some uncertainty now in the U.S. as regards, you know, how things are going to work out for visas for people coming from certain countries. So I think the earlier that you can get in the process, um, if that may be a concern, the better. And, and of course, you know, it's not just visas and financing. Um, housing and, you know, the whole logistical process of organizing your life to move to a new location will be easier if you get admitted earlier rather than later. Right. Right. And, and, and Jessica, also we're, we're living through travel bans and uh, the, that's sort of raising people's uh, concerns, but um, 
how, how important do you think it is from that scholarship and, uh, and, and visa piece for, for the top US schools? Yeah, uh, I mean, I echo what Caroline said. Um, scholarships, fellowships are probably going to be much more limited by the last rounds because there's always that possibility the majority, if not all, of, uh, of that money might have been allocated to the top applicants or the top admits in rounds one and two. And then, you know, there's some you know, there's some projections because not everyone who's admitted, who is, uh, you know, awarded a fellowship or, or money is going to take it and come to the school. So there's always that chance some of the money get, might go back in the pot. But there's, you know, no one can really accurately 100% predict how much is going to be left for the last round. So so it is, if, if you really do want to be competitive uh, and be considered for, for merit types of fellowships and, and awards, it is probably wiser to, or these better to apply earlier in the round um, when there is more money to go around. Um, for visas, I mean, I remember when I was at Anderson, there were, definitely were international students admitted in round three. Um, and I, I don't recall if anyone couldn't come because their visas didn't come through at the last minute or it just, it, the process took longer than expected. But um, it was definitely a lot more scrambling for those that were admitted later. Like, you know, you really had to be on top of making sure you had your I-20s, your forms, everything, um, your, your sources for funding, all of that squared away right away. Um, and then you're able to also, like what Caroline was saying, figure out what the logistics of are of moving, you know, to a new country and getting settled in. And there was, you know, for a lot of schools, there might be, uh, in, in the U.S., international students might need to come a little earlier just because there might be a, another, maybe an international student orientation for a day or a week or whatever amount of time. So you might have to even come a little earlier just to get settled and acclimated. So, um, you know, just keeping all these things in mind, if it, if it seems like it's not going to be feasible or there's just going to be way too much, uh, you know, last minute types of things you might have to do to even get into uh, and start school, then perhaps it's better to wait until the next uh, the next application cycle, um, if that's a possibility, um, just so you have more time and, and a little less stress, um, especially with what's going on in the U.S. That, that's enough, that is something, and, and no one really knows how that's going to play out over the next few months or a few years. Um, so, but, but it is good to just keep keep that in mind and plan ahead and just kind of build in some buffer time, you know, just in case so, there might be some complications. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, of course, the, the, the golden advice is always uh, for, for the top schools to apply with uh, the strongest possible application, you know, at whatever part of the admission cycle. That, that's, if we assume that, you know, here's the applicant with a competitive and well-balanced GMAT score. They've got um, recommenders that have really, uh, you know, put in the work to, to, to speak on their behalf. Uh, coherent career narrative, and 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 they're, they're left with, right. So you guys have talked about you know the numbers game, the, the, the squeeze on the places available. Hard for me to assess, you know, if a lot of bankers, consultants, and have already you know uh, been allocated places, and where does where does that leave me? So, um, in, in which cases would you recommend then waiting for for the next admissions season and, and hitting round one, and perhaps uh, in in your answers um, also um, anticipate the idea that if I did apply in this final round and, and was dinged, um, how might that affect my chances with that same school if I applied in round one or round two in the following season? Yeah. Um, go, ahead, oh, go ahead, Carol. Okay. Um, well, I, I think if you've applied to schools in rounds one and two and you were not admitted, I think it's this is now the time where you have to really go back and reflect and look very closely at your application and look at areas that you know, you think you can improve upon. And realistically, given your profile, and maybe you have to adjust your expectations and maybe some schools that you're applying for in round three that are going to be more competitive or where you have better chances of being admitted, um, and really think about whether or not that this is really the right time to go for those schools or maybe wait up, wait till the following uh, cycle. So I would say, you know, if, if you feel like you need to, you need a significant amount of time to maybe you know, kind of revamp your application. So maybe retaking tests and you need more time to retake or prepare for a GMAT or GRE or, or TOEFL. Um, it's better to not rush it because if you're just kind of putting something together last minute and it didn't get you into other schools, I mean, you have to consider what's the chance that this is going to help me, that I'm going to be able to get in, in round three, maybe to a different, less competitive school, but yet at the same time for, you know, competing for less spots in the class at this stage. 
Um, so if you really want to spend more time to put together a stronger overall application, um, I would also consider who you're going to ask for letters of recommendation because if you have a short window of time for round three, um, the deadlines are coming up fairly soon, and um, you want to give that person ample time to put together a recommendation if, if you're looking for someone new. Perhaps if it's someone that you already asked, they can, you know, they can work off of something that they've already written in the past. Um, and also if you haven't really done much research on the programs you're considering at this point, if you don't really know much about, let's say, INSEAD or, or Anderson or, or Stern or whatever other schools maybe that are on your on the next list of schools you want to apply for round three, and you're just kind of applying as a shot in the dark, it's, I, I don't think that's really going to help your chances. Um, and if anything, uh, when it comes to reapplying next year, if you apply to these schools and you're not admitted and then you decide to reapply maybe round one or two the following year, um, you're going to be considered a reapplicant. So your application process will be slightly different. Typically it'll mean that you'll have a reapplicant essay and you'll mark on your application that you, you know, you had applied in the past. So the admissions committee is immediately going to be clued in that, you know, you're, you, you were not admitted before and now they want to see what has changed or what has improved in your candidacy since your original application. Um, and there's always that, you know, and, and so you want to make sure that you have enough time to really be able to show, you know, a significant or an amount of improvement or change. You don't want to submit the exact same application and the same profile from a time that you were not admitted because that's just not going to reflect well on your, on your application. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's not just a question that now it's one of the earlier rounds that, that there might be some fundamentals that uh, that you need to address. Um, I'm sure many of those uh, areas also apply to, to INSEAD and other uh, top international schools. Caroline? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. And I would say, I mean, most schools are open to reapplications and, and um, you know, are very happy for candidates who have been dinged to, to come back. But as Jessica said, you know, they do want to see some evolution in your profile. And if you apply with exactly the same profile, most likely you're going to get exactly the same response. Mm -hmm. So I think if you apply in round three, if the competition is going to be tougher and, and you get dinged because of that level of competition, you might be um, doing yourself a disservice then um, to have to come back as a reapplicant. You might actually be better off, um, you know, if you can, waiting until round one and applying then as a fresh applicant rather than, you know, being someone who's reapplying and therefore, you know, with the best one in the world, you know, they want to give you a fair review, but they they will know that you've applied already and been dinged. So even, you know, that may have play some sort of, a, there may be an unconscious bias um, towards the candidate. Um, you know, they are viewing you from the lens of, you know, you are a reapplicant, you've been rejected already. And so you kind of have to show what has changed and how you're better than when you applied before. And, um, you know, that gives you six months. So in some cases, perhaps you would be able to improve your profile. Perhaps you, know, you can retake the GMAT or perhaps you, know, you, you are able to show more substantial results in your work or perhaps get a promotion or show something additional in your extracurricular um, activities. Um, but if you think that it's going to be difficult for you to show that kind of substantial evolution in your profile between now and round one, and you're not sure about whether to apply now or in round one, then I would say it's probably better to wait and then apply um, as a you know as as a new candidate for the school in in that round. Uh, I would also say that you know in round three, uh, you know it's a common experience across schools or in the final round that you see um, overall the the quality of the pool is a bit lower than the earlier rounds. And I think it's because, you know, you get more applications from people who, um, you know, have thought about it at the last minute, you know, not very good at planning, um, they're real prevaricators and they just, you know, couldn't pull it together until the very last minute and realize it's now or never, it's, you know, the round three deadline is a week away and if I don't submit now, then that's it for the next year. So you definitely see some app applicants like that where, uh, you know, they're not the best candidates and part of that is demonstrated through how they behave in the applicant process where, you know, they've just thrown their application together at the last minute. Um, and, and so, you know, you do tend to see the candidates, um, you know, a high percentage of candidates who are very well prepared, well prepared in round, round, round one and round, round two. Round um, and so I think you have to do even more in round three to show that, you know, you are not one of those people who's just applying um, kind of last minute scramble. Yes. 
you almost have to you know go above and beyond in the quality of your application and also um, in, in demonstrating your fit with the school and your motivation for the school as Jessica said you know the schools are very well aware that if you're applying in the final round you may well have been deemed elsewhere earlier in the season and they no school wants to admit someone um, because they're applying a, to your school as an afterthought this, you have to um, convince the school that they're absolutely your number one choice and I think you have to make even more of an effort to do that in the final round than in the earlier rounds. Right, we, we, we spoke at the beginning of the webinar of sort of um, traditional profiles applying to business school and you know, GMAC, the owners of the GMAC test, uh, you know, often talk about people on average maybe thinking 18 months or you know two years before applying to business school in, in, in their preparations. So. Um, uh, you talked about a restaurant owner that perhaps suddenly found that this was a great time to, to, to go back to school. Um, but if I am working at the Fortune 500 company or, uh, or a consultant, uh, are the schools going to say, come on, you know, your, your peers have been thinking about this for months and months and months. How come you're only showing up now? So, so how can I, um, uh, it's one thing for me to, have, the entrepreneur that suddenly sold my company and business school was a, was a great next chapter to, to pursue. Mm. Um, but if I'm in a, a, um, a more sort of corporate setting, you know, how can I convince them um, that, it, you know, that this is the right time and you know, showing that love for the school that, that you were just describing? Yeah, so I would say, you know, um, it, it could be more difficult, as you say, if you've got a profile where, you know, they would expect you to know quite a lot about business school and to be able to plan your timing. So, you know, if you're working at one of the top consulting firms where they have a track and they feed people into business school uh, on, a, uh, on a sort of particular cycle, um, then, you know, the school may well presume that you've applied elsewhere and, and you're applying now because you've been dinged elsewhere. Um, I mean, that, that's okay, but it, it, I think it comes back to, um, you know, really articulating why that school is a good choice for you and what you're going to contribute to the program and what you're going to get out of that specific program. And the schools do see a lot of applications in the final round where, you know, the, the, the level of knowledge about the school is, you know, is quite sparse. And, and so, um, so you do have to make an effort to, you know, for example, if you can visit the school, um, that would be ideal. Um, there's no substitute for actually being on campus and, and, and meeting students and meeting the staff and perhaps sitting in on a class and, you know, getting that kind of first-hand exposure to the community. Um, and that will give you a lot to talk about in your application and your interviews about, you know, your sense of, of affinity with the program. Um, so I'd say, I would say, you know, that, that would be ideal if you could do that. Um, you know, if time and resources and, and distance don't allow, then you know, do make a big effort to reach out to the school, um, try to identify people in your network or the network of your network who have some connection with the school and you know, have discussions with them and learn about their experience. Um, because all of that will uh, give you a better sense of uh, you know, what the school is about and, and what you're going to get out of the program. And that does shine through. Farm readers are very experienced at at sort of even reading between the lines to get a sense for whether someone has a sense of affinity with a particular program. Um, you know, even in the language that you use when you talk about doing an MBA, if you have, you know, the lingo that a particular school uses, they're going to have, um, they're going to feel that, you know, you resonate more with that community. Um, and, you know, definitely the interview stage, it's very, very important. Uh, you know, in, in, in the written applications, some schools give you more space than others to talk directly about your motivation for the school. So some of them will ask about it specifically and you have to write a question about that. Um, some of them it's not direct and so you, you sort of weave that into your story if you can. Um, and then, um, but for all schools, you know, the interview stage conveying that motivation is, is very, very important. So, you know, if, if you're in that situation where you have a profile where um, you know people have applied uh, with your profile in round one and round two, and they may the school may be wondering, you know, why you're applying now. I think the, the only way that you can overcome that really is by um, demonstrating your fit with the school and and showing that you've really done your homework um, and that you have a real genuine passion for the school. 
um, I think that's the only only way that you can overcome that that potential barrier. Right. Well, we we've seen you know from the volatility of the financial markets in uh, sort of seven eight years ago. Uh, recently, I guess um, in the oil and gas industry, as a, a barrel of oil hit twenty-eight dollars, that you know certain sectors um, very cyclical, and and they'll hit a, a real downturn, and companies are very quick to then let people go. Um, uh, Jessica, from experience, if if you'd have an applicant in in round three, uh, you know, working in the energy sector, and, and um, you know Exxon Mobil um, uh, gave them their marching orders in in February, is it then? Um, sort of understandable to you as an admissions officer that uh, one of the ways they're looking to bounce back is, is applying to business school. Will, will you be more forgiving of you know, uh, what, what they've just experienced and why they're now applying in the last round? Yeah, I, I'm, and I would actually say um, if there is some sort of ex, you know, extenuating circumstance or some, some circumstance as to why you're applying in round three, maybe because yeah, you got laid off and there's just a lot of layoffs going on in your particular industry or maybe there was a, a financing issue. Um, I would say use it very carefully because it's, you don't want to make it sound like it's an excuse or you're using that as a, you know, just as an excuse as to why you put it off till, you know, till round three to apply. But if there's genuinely a reason why, you know, you waited or this was the ideal time to submit your application, um, then perhaps um, thinking about utilizing the optional essay to explain what the circumstance was, um, you know, that can just shed a little more context and light for the admissions committee. Um, but that would not preclude you from doing all those things that Caroline mentioned in terms of showing, conveying the genuine interest, doing your research. Um, that would just be an additional data point that could be helpful when the admissions committee is looking at your profile and your decision to apply to business school and the timing. Um, versus, you know, maybe not have that info and then they might not really quite know what your your personal uh, situation was. But again, I, I say that use it carefully because, again, there is that fine line between a genuine reason and then making it sound like an, an excuse. Um, and then yeah. if it comes veers toward that route, then it actually could, you know, uh, be looked upon negatively. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if, um, you know, with Brexit, if, if a number of the banks that look to uh, um, move people to, to, to the continent in the next two years and, and they might use the MBA as a way to make that shift but um, I guess there's, there's, <laughs> there's so much political volatility in the last 12 months that, uh, um, that, that, that the jury's out on that. We, we may even find um, that applications in, in round two at some of the top schools have, have dropped um, and, and where that will leave them for, for round three. So I think that you know, there's an element of watch this space for, for the final rounds yeah. for, for September because schools may not have seen the sort of volumes that they were hoping for um, and, and you know with Iranian students and others that can uh, no longer to come to the US um, to complete their studies so certainly um, keep in touch with us. Um, one question that I mean we you know, speak to hundreds of, of, of applicants every month with, with the, um, the free consultations um, if, if we're either looking at then postponing to apply to round one or we've applied, got dinged and then need to sort of reassess our strategies, Jessica you've given some very um, helpful advice um, on that. Um, maybe if we can take two examples, the, 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 the 24, 25 year old, um, so still in the early stages of their career and an opportunity to continue to build that experience and if they had a weaker GMAT or GRE score uh, or some of those data points, maybe taking a class, you know, many things that they could do. But one of the questions we get quite often is from uh, older applicants who already have six, seven, eight years of professional experience under their belt and the schools turned them down. Um, can they then go and get the international experience that was missing for a school like NCAD or LBS or, you know, are, are there any differences between somebody in the earlier stages of their career and those at the later stages or later, um, it's sort of six, seven years in um, and how they may then approach the next admission cycle and things that they can do to strengthen their profile. Um, I mean, I can say for those who have that, that are on the higher end of years of work experience, I mean, definitely I've, I've seen a good number of those applicants during my time at Anderson. Um, the biggest, I think the, the, one of the biggest concerns was if you have a, was ready or like why you're getting an MBA now. So the why now was a big, you know, that was definitely looked upon when we were um, evaluating the application. So why did you wait until this point in your career to get your MBA? So really 
thinking about the reasons why it's really necessary at this stage in your career versus maybe you know two to three four plus years prior to and what you still hope to gain from the experience um, the other part is I think you want to show growth and progression uh, and sometimes with, with those that have more experience, there seems to be a plateau in, in the actual kind of experiences and growth professionally. And so I think it's really important to show that, yes, you've, been, you've progressed, you've taken on additional responsibilities, you've you know, been able to showcase additional leadership, maybe for someone who has more experience and you are going to have to show that you, your leadership skills are going to be more robust, or those examples of managing are going to be robust compared to someone that only has maybe you know, two to three years of experience. Um, and just showing that you haven't been doing the same thing you know, day in and day out for the last like, you know, two to three years of your career, and now that you know, you're, you're stuck, you've hit, a, you've hit a wall and you have no place else to go, that's why you're getting an MBA. It kind of, it, when someone shows a narrative like that, then I think it makes it a lot harder for them to really make a compelling case um, for why now is the best time to go back to school. Um, and so I think for those who maybe have some, uh, that are kind of on that, on that higher end of experience to show really meaningfully, you know, what is it that you want to get out of business school? What are some areas that you can, you know, that you want to improve upon that you can really get from this time um, going back to school? And then what are your, re what are realistic career goals after you graduate, um, both short term and long term? You know, whether you're a career enhancer or a switcher, um, you know, what is it really realistically that you can do at this point? Um, and, and then also showing that, you know, you're still going to be a really active, um, contributing member to the community. Um, you know, that age is an age and, you know, whatever maybe level you are, uh, you know, within your, your career isn't going to make you feel like you're not going to fit into the community. You're still going to, um, you know, really engage with your peers, build your network, build relationships, and you're going to make a meaningful contribution, you know, during your time as a student and then as a part of the alumni network. So if you were not admitted in the past and you, you have, and you're, and you think that, you know, having too much experience or being older, uh, on the older end of the spectrum might be an area that was a concern for the admissions committee, then really kind of addressing those areas as to why it shouldn't, um, you know, it really should not be something that should deter you from being a strong contributor and leader um, and fit with the community is going to really help to stand, make you stand out. Great. Yeah, Caroline, of course, you only recently turned 30. It's good to know that, you know, we can still make a valuable contribution to the community at this stage. <laughs> um, and, and, and any other you know, th thoughts in, in terms of um, you know, the, the age of an applicant and how that may play through in what they can then do to strengthen their profile? Yes, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with Jessica that um, you know, the, the career goals are very important for an older candidate and schools will cut more slack to younger candidates on um, the clarity um, of the career vision than they will for older candidates. So, you know, if you are um, above the average age for the program, they're going to expect you to have, um, you know, a really uh, good map regarding, you know, what you want to do in the short term, the long term, and they will want to, you know, they need to bit of buy into that, right? So it has to be a realistic career plan um, because, you know, schools see that younger candidates. Um, have more flexible options in recruitment when they come out of the program and um, and you know if manage to repackage themselves more easily if necessary in the in the job search process um, and that's sometimes more difficult for older students so so they will be scrutinizing career goals very carefully and you know if you've been and you're coming back as a reapplicant and you're a little bit older, I mean, that's certainly an area of your application to scrutinize very carefully um, to see if you've got that right. Um, and absolutely agree that, I mean, the concern that the admissions committees often have about older candidates is whether they will gel well with their fellow students. And, um, you know, schools do sometimes have experiences where students who are, you know, on the margins um, in, in the age group and on the older side, um, do sometimes struggle to, to fit in socially or, um, you know, feel that they are, uh, you know, not getting as much out of the teamwork if they're sitting alongside someone who, you know, is 23 or 24 years old and has two years at McKinsey versus their, you know, 12 years in industry. Uh, that can be a difficult dynamic. And so the schools are very 
careful about that and they want to make sure that people that they bring into the school um, will uh, you know embrace the community and and um, you know be able to fit in well um, so that's something you know so they'll be looking at, at things like adaptability flexibility um, you know ability to work with very different types of people that becomes more important I think for older candidates versus someone who's really you know right around the average age or on the, on the younger side um, so that's those are things I think to think about very carefully if you know you're 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 coming into round three and, and it's going to be more competitive or if you're going to be you know reapplying at a later date as a, as a somewhat older candidate right and what one of our viewers has just um, sent in a question and you know in, in, as we approach the last 10 minutes do do send in uh, any questions that you have. I know that we've covered a lot of ground. I think they were picking up on uh, your encouragement, uh, Caroline, to, to make a campus visit if, if that is possible. Um, and it's looking at, you know, between now and for many of the school's deadlines, um, I guess in Seattle it's uh, early March, many of the top US schools it's sort of early April. Um, just any suggestions on how to interact with the school, um, given that they don't now have a lot of time uh, and want to put their applications together. So, so campus visit. I'm sure if if that's an option. Uh, what are your, some of your, some of your some of your other some of your other positive and potentially impactful uh, outreach to the schools at this point? So I lost you a second there, Matt. Um, question was what else they can do in terms of outreach to the school. That's right. Yeah, well, just ideas for how they can sort of. Um, uh, connect with the school, interact with the school, uh, and, and obviously then use it in their final round application. Sure. Yeah, so, um, I mean, also try to identify um, groups within the school that are specifically interesting to you, given your academic interests and your future career interests. Um, you know, that can be a good route into connecting with people who have similar interests and, and therefore, you know, maybe willing to engage and, and discuss with you as an applicant, so you know, if you have a specific interest in, um, you know, real estate or private equity, or you know, uh, there are a lot of clubs on the campuses addressing specific interest groups and um, you know, academic interests or career interests. Um, that can be a good way of identifying people, current students or professors, um, who you could reach out to, where you know they would they would be happy to discuss, you know, what the school has. Uh, you know, has to offer in that domain and, and, you know, how that could help you. So that, if you can identify, you know, your specific fit with the school and um, other people at the school who have similar interests, um, you know, often on the school websites you can identify club presidents or, you know, contact people that you can reach out to. So do, I um, mean, you know, it requires some, uh, some detailed research to identify um, the, those those individuals, but you know that can be a good route in rather than just you know sending a message out of the blue to um, uh, you know the, the admissions office at a time of year when you know they may be very very busy, where they're juggling multiple rounds at this stage as well as the wait list, um, and so you know it can be harder at this time of year for the admissions office to to spare time for candidates versus earlier in the season. So, um, you know, reaching out to other members of the community, students, faculty, alumni, where you have, you know, you, you can make some connection given common interests could be a good route into, you know, building some relationships. Do you know if you have other suggestions on that point, Jessica? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, you know, reiterating what you were saying, Caroline, about reaching out to the community. I mean, I would say the vast majority, I mean, almost everyone at business school wants to share their experience. Um, the nice thing at least about engaging with someone now is that especially for the first year students, they've had you know a good amount of time having been, been settled into the program. Um, and then the, set, the second years might start to check out a little bit if you know and they're like getting ready to graduate. But you know everyone still wants to help in terms of bringing the, the future you know future classmates into the program and sell the school and really share their experience um, you know I think students love doing that um, and so um, I think being really targeted just because uh, of the lack of time you have at this point or, or just the fact that you have such a short window of time if you haven't um, done any outreach up until this point is to be very hyper targeted in terms of who you 
go to. So, you know, definitely if you have, if you know students in your network, you know, that are current students or alumni of the programs, maybe start with them also because maybe they can point you to specific people that have maybe similar career interests as you or are interested in, you know, maybe certain clubs that you're also interested in or maybe want to go from a, you know, from have a similar career switching path that you have coming from like marketing into consulting or whatnot, for example. Um, you know, I think then then it's just a lot easier or you're you're able to hone in and get the essence of what the school's about in the community and maybe specific resources versus having, you know, going and kind of mosing on the website and then finding some, you know, resources here and there and just spending a lot of time trying to gather all that info. Like I think just utilizing the network and the people and the community um, and the student ambassadors are going to really be helpful just to you know help you get there a lot faster. Great. Um, a couple more questions. Let's try to, uh, to tackle all of these um, either with an applicant that has um, fewer years of, of work experience, but um, they're asking about optional essays, which you know are part of the um, application, whether you're applying in round one or round three. Um, and what is just uh, some quick advice for the optional essay? Does it does it show that um, you know that that you've you've thrown everything at this application and including right. <laughs> an extra two hundred and fifty words for that, or should it be used with with caution and only for good reason? Yeah, I, I would say it varies um, depending on the school and the length of the application overall. So, for example, INSEAD has a lot of essays as well as an optional essay. And um, in general, it's better not to use the optional essay unless there really is something that you know just doesn't fit in elsewhere. Um, and because the application is so comprehensive, in most cases, candidates don't need to use the optional essay. Um, so, so there, I would say, you know, don't don't fill up the space for the sake of it. You know, it's much better left blank unless you have something you know really critical to say, to say that doesn't fit into one of the other questions. Um, but for other schools where um, you know there are less uh, uh, core essays, so London Business School, um, uh, you know some of the top U.S. schools, if they've only got one or two essays and plus an optional essay. In many cases, you know you should definitely use that space um, to convey an additional dimension of your profile that you think helps to make you stand out and is not uh, you know conveyed in detail in another part of the application. Um, so I think you know it depends on the length of the application overall. And so if it's a short application overall, then I would use the optional essay. And if it's a long application overall, I would probably leave it blank, unless, right. unless you have to use it. And it definitely, if you have some sort of circumstance um, or context you want to provide to the admissions committee, so you know if there was maybe a particular semester in university where you didn't do so well, um, that's kind of an aberration versus the rest of your time in school or an employment gap or something that you want to um, explain or just provide a bit more background information on that's valid. Um, you know, you can use a, that's definitely the. Uh, what the optional essay is there for you to utilize. Um, like Caroline was saying, I I wouldn't use it if, it, if you're just reiterating something that's already been stated in the application. Um, the other one, and then I say this because I, I personally never like this essay, use of the optional essay is when someone was trying to explain a low GMAT score um, because they just, and, and they didn't really provide any information aside from it's, it's just not indicative of my abilities. Yeah. Um, it's not really useful in the, when, Evaluating the application, um, if there is a certain circumstance, okay, that's def that's fine. But if it's just it are reiterating, well, it's a low score, and but it's really not indicative of how I'm going to do in the program. It's it's probably not going to really be beneficial. So so I wouldn't recommend utilizing the the essay for something like that. Yeah, I agree. Right. Right. So that's that's very good advice. Um, I, I guess just with, with with a couple of minutes left, you know, we, we will have um, some viewers that that will be um, heading to, to round three. And in terms of, um, you know, certainly from my perspective, and working with uh, such uh, an experienced team of former admissions officers, um, if if you're wondering what your chances are um, applying in in round three versus. Uh, holding on for six more months and um, being at the front of the queue in round one, do do reach out and get in touch because we try to um, contextualize, you know, the quality of your profile. Um, as Jessica just gave the example of of test scores and all of those different pieces uh, that help us to provide, uh, you know, real sort of uh, insider expertise 
um, and the chances that you would have applying in the final round uh, versus you know, waiting a few more months. So uh, those consultations are intended to be very, uh, very candid. Uh, and certainly we hope very helpful as, as you try to make that uh, decision. If, if people are um, taking a shot at, at the final round, Caroline, just uh, maybe just a couple of final thoughts as, as we wrap up the webinar on um, you know, how they can then prepare, um, whether it's you know, two, two, two weeks away for INSEAD. I know some people are reaching out to you for the admissions director evaluation at this stage for the work they've put together, but even for those round three applications, just how they can um, you know, maybe uh, cover all of their bases to put together a sparkling application. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, don't delay. Um, now is the time. Um, <laughs> so, you know, for some, for many of the round three uh, op options, you know, you've got five or six weeks ahead of you. So it's still, um, you know, good time frame um, to put together a strong application. Uh, I would say, you know, start with looking at um, your recommendations and you know who you're going to mobilise there. Um, that's something to you know that, that is always it's always good to start that at the beginning of your um, of the process of developing your application because you know you, you need to give them plenty of time to um, to put put together their their letters of recommendation so um, you know do figure out now who you're going to ask have the discussions with them um, and uh, you know give them some give them give them a good briefing on uh, you know why you're applying the points that you would like them to highlight, the examples that they can give, uh, so that you know they're in a good position to write a strong and detailed recommendation for you. So I would say you know that's a good place to start if you if you're in the sort of countdown to deadline period, and if you haven't haven't done that already. Um, and then I would say um, you know I I often advise candidates to start with the application form before diving into the essays. And um, you know, it's somewhat counterintuitive because you know you think the essays are um, you know the biggest task. It's going to take a lot of time, and and um, so the temptation is to start there first. And the application form looks much more straightforward and rather boring. So you know, tempting to leave that to the last minute. Um, but actually, you know, the far reader will often uh, look at that before they look at your essays because it's got a lot of the hard data about your profile. And so um, you know, it's very important to pay that careful attention. Um, you'll need to go through uh, a few iterations of that as well, even though it looks very straightforward. You know, you do have to be very careful about um, getting that right. Um, and there will be some um, fields where you'll need to write, you know, it's almost sometimes a, a mini essay. Uh, and that can sometimes catch candidates under, unaware that, you know, they're sort of leaving the application form into the last few days and then they realize that they have to write um, some quite substantial answers in that as well. Um, so don't get caught up by that. And, and also, you know, it's a good place to start because, you know, the far reader will be looking at your application first and um, uh, the application form first before they look at the essays. And so it provides very useful context for the essays. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's useful to start thinking about the essay questions once you've got your data down on paper and some of your um, you know your responses to those short answer questions in the application form because the essays should be complementary to that and not repetitive um, and should help to build on some of the points that you convey in the application form. Um, so, so I would suggest you know uh, recommendations you know get those underway, um, work on the application form, get that out of the way. It shouldn't be too difficult but um, you know, it's it's really a, a very important foundation for your application, and then and then turn your attention to the essays. And um, you know, with the essays, you need some time to reflect, and um, you know, you probably need to go through a period of brainstorming, of thinking about um, you know. And some of the questions are very open ended, so uh, there are many different ways that you could tackle them, and and that's often you know an area where we spend quite a bit of our time with our clients to think about you know the different approaches that that candidate could take and, and the different messages that they, they um, could convey and, and what is going to you know, help to build a really strong story that will stand out and, and, and build a, um, you know, a clear image in the far reader's mind of what they can bring to the program. Um, so I think you know, before you um, start writing the essays, you know, go through a reflection period of, of um, brainstorming and um, 
and, and thinking about the key messages that you want to get across in your application as a whole um, before you actually really put pen to paper on, on those essays. And then, you know, plan it out over time. So, sorry, to just, you know, don't leave it to the last minute. As I said, you know, often the schools will see candidates applying in the final round that have clearly left everything to the last minute. So, you know, use those uh, four, five, six weeks wisely. Oh, I was just going to add um, just one quick thing is um, we, we uh, think about redoing or just revising your resume too <laughs> just because especially if you submitted maybe in round one um, that could have been since there might have been some significant changes to your work experience or leadership or contributions you made in the last you know four to six months or so so I would say you know really think about ways that you've grown and developed since the time you submitted your first applications, your earlier ones, and make sure you update your resume just to capture everything that's happened, um, you know, with, between that time and then when you submit your applications for round three. Well, that and other pearls of wisdom that both of you have shared uh, on this webinar, um, we've recorded the session and, and it will um, go onto the Fortuna website um, where you'll find an archive of, of these webinars as we look at uh, so many different aspects of um, the application process. Uh, so do check those out um, and you might find uh, other great material um, just like um, the sort of advice that Jessica and Caroline have very kindly uh, taken the time to share with us uh, today. I know that a special nod to a very talented and charming young man in uh, New Delhi that I spoke to earlier today who was intent on um, setting up to um, join us for this webinar and looking at the clock it must be about 2.30 in the morning so uh, Ashish if you're with us um, thank you for, for staying I hope that it was helpful to you and to everybody else that joined us again Caroline Jessica uh, thanks for your time and uh, we look forward to um, everybody reaching out for more of this advice as you put together applications in the coming weeks or in the year ahead thanks everybody for being with us good night thanks very much yeah. thanks